This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, here we are after a weekend of... I'd say not even a weekend, a week of good Flames hockey. We're talking about three wins in the last week over Philly, Minnesota, and St. Louis. Matt, you've got to be liking where we are right now. When was the last time we were talking about this many wins in a month for the Flames? Well, the past couple of years we've had a decent run in December, and the Flames are now 7-1 and one to start the month, which you, you can't really complain too much about that. No, and they sit... Atop the cent- or atop the Pacific Division once again, and atop the Western Conference as we uh, look at the last three games. Let's get into this. The game that apparently, depending on how you read things that happened today, got was the thing that got Dave Haskell fired. Was the Calgary game? Uh, Calgary ended up winning six five in this one, and what a late c- comeback this was for the Flames. I remember sitting watching this. We had the Giordano goal with, or the, sorry, the Monaghan goal with seven seconds left. How often do you see that? Oh, I know. A friend of mine uh, and her children are a huge Flyers fans, and they were at the game. And you know, uh, in a way, I was actually happy that the they the Flyers were winning that game just for them. But then the Flames, like everybody involved, was like, "What just happened?" <laughs> So, you know, it was a Patton and Flames comeback victory, which, you know, not how you draw it up well, for sure. But Well, we saw we saw the uh, Rasmus Anderson goal, and we're like, yeah, okay, Calgary came within one, and all the guys in the media lounge starting to pack up our gear. And then Monty scores, like, unpack, unpack. This game might go longer. <laughs> so, um, yep. yeah, we were, all, yeah. we were all expecting to talk about a loss. I know, like, it was pretty much just watching the game, counting it down, just to put my notes together for the show, and it's like, oh, well, they lost, and how disappointing of an effort, this, that, and the next thing, and then, and throw that out. <laughs> and then 35 seconds into the overtime, this is one that Johnny decided, you know what, I don't want to stay too late tonight, and he popped the overtime winner 35 seconds in. Yeah. Not much you can say about that one. It was shoddy defense lo- allowing Provorov to get that breakaway, but it, they recovered, and it, anytime the Flames have an odd man rush in overtime, it's pretty much in the net. You know, this is one of those games, and we've talked about them before, where, yeah, if you score six, you should win, but also if you let five by you, you should lose. Like This is one of those weird games. Yeah, very reminiscent of the Columbus game from last week. Exactly. And that's kind of when I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, another one of these. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, I thought Smith had a really good first period. And when he allowed that first goal in the second, he looked a little off. And then the wheels fell off the wagon entirely. And not much you could say, uh, you know, it wasn't his fault on the first three goals. The fourth one was a bit of a stinker, though. Yeah, there's some defensive breakdowns. I mean... Philly, for as bad as they're doing, they're a good team. Like, we talked about this last week. They got some good forwards. They got some good pieces on that team. I'm surprised they're doing as poorly as they are. Well, it's somewhat similar to the Flames when in the last couple years when they missed the playoffs, where, like, the good players are very good, but the not-so-good players, like, are basically below-average AHL talent, and there's not really too much of a gulf... (laughs) But, like, there's not, for their third and fourth lines and their third, second and third pairing defensemen, like, there's not a lot of talent there at all. And they're now on their sixth goalie, so soon, you know, they'll be calling around the league for, hey, do you have an emergency goalie that we can start? <laughs> I mean, we've still got a couple of goalies with Mason and, uh, and um, who's the guy from Dallas? Lettinen. Lettinen still available, so I don't think they'll be calling for emergencies yet. Yeah. Well, Carter Hart's making his NHL debut in the next couple of days, so that that for anybody who's a fan of goalies like I am, it's 
something to look forward to seeing because he looks like he'll be a good one. But yeah, it, it's a bit of a disaster in Philadelphia right now. And the big story in this game was coming into the third period, the Flames made a goalie change, uh, putting Riddick in to start. According to Coach Peters after the game, he said this was a decision they made just before going on the ice, that something wasn't right with Smitty. So good for Riddick for stepping in and uh, saving 80% of the shots that came his way. And really, I'd say, I don't want to say keeping the Flames in this one, but looking strong in the last bit of this game. Well, that that save in overtime was pivotal. That was, yeah. And it, he played well. Like there, he he didn't face that many shots though. So it just you know there was that one breakaway that led to the Couturier goal, and yeah, it it is what it is. And we weren't sure what was going to happen with Smitty in this one. And after this game, uh, the Flames decided that he they wouldn't put him on on injury reserve, so he wasn't even going to be out for a week. But they should probably make a an insurance call up, let's say, before they go on the road. And they ended up calling, and a guy who didn't play but sat on the bench for the next game against the Wild was John Gillies. Got the call, and once again, David Riddick in the net as the Calgary Flames once again beat the Wild two to one. It was nice to see the Flames be able to both exact revenge on the Wild in terms of the physicality especially after that Dumba hit in the previous matchup, and then still not get away from the fact that, oh, we need to get the two points as well. And they sent the message of, we're not going to take this, and they got the two points. So good on them, full marks, for having an emotional game, but not letting the emotions take over. When we see teams play games this early in the day, we often don't see the best hockey. And I thought... You know, is this the best game the Flames have played? No, but for a game that was before noon Calgary time, I thought it was a really entertaining game. Yeah, like this is that's the normal like pregame skate <laughs> time. Yeah, you wonder if they even had a pregame skate. It's like, yeah, yeah, scrap practice, boys. Just you know, go beat up the other team. <laughs> that's almost where you have to have a curfew the night before to make sure everybody's up and awake. Yeah, it's like your minor team. So, yeah, 2-1 to one win there for the Flames. Giordano got his fifth and Kachuk got his 14th, and I think you pretty much summed this one up. And then the next day, Calgary went to St. Louis, and this is a team that's been struggling this year, and we, we lit them up. Uh, 7-2 win for the Flames, getting two goals from Kachuk and two goals from Quine. Uh, oh, sorry, Goudreau, Goudreau, Goudreau right. Kachuk. Kachuk got his 15th, yeah. Lindholm got his 17th. Giordano got his sixth, Quine got his second and third, and Gudra got his 14th and 15th. So Now Quine now has three times as many goals as Milan Lucic, which, you know, small difference in paycheck there. Quine's, what, two away from Neil now? One. One? Okay, I thought Neil had... F- You're right, yeah. Because Neil has five, right? And Quine's got three. No, uh, he has four. Okay. So, yeah. That's going to be a tough conversation for the coaches when they say, we called this guy up from the AHL. How is he scoring more than you? Yeah. Come on, bud. You know, stop uh, hitting the post or just missing the net. Start putting him in. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, Quine's showing well for himself. Yeah, oh, for sure. And, frankly, like, I liked Quine back when he was with Detroit and didn't feel that he got a proper shot with them, and that's why he went to the island. And he had some success, and then not the next year. So sort of like Josh Juris when he was with us. Uh, the first year he was good, and then the second year, uh, not so much. And, you know, players like that are inconsistent, but he's m- making the most of it, and good for him. Uh, hopefully he can keep up, not necessarily the offense, but just the decent all-around play that he's had. When you've got your fourth line guys scoring that much, it's a good sign because at some point, Matt, that purple Gatorade line has to slow down a bit, right? Oh, definitely. And like, I don't think that you can expect like all the point per game players that the Flames have right now to put up like a ninety, ninety five, a hundred points. Like there wasn't even that many players in the NHL that had ninety plus points, but to have like five on pace for that. Like, Jared now is only three points away from his season total last year. Like, we're in the middle of December. Yep. Like, come on. The guy could coast <laughs> for a month and still beat his records. 
he could just take a nap until the end of March and pretty much tie his record. I mean, if he has a good game, he could be get that in one game. Yeah. So this, and I I feel bad for Jake Allen because I didn't think he played that badly. It's just that his team in front of him was just so bad that like there was nothing that he could do on pretty much every one of the goals. And this, we saw Riddick play this one as well. Um, Smitty was back on the bench as the as the backup goalie, but good to see him there. Um, you know, Riddick gets two starts in a row, which we don't often see, and good to see him in net and looking good on that second start. I don't want to. Uh, we've talked about this before. I don't want to give one guy the start over the other, but it's nice to see Riddick coming along. With I mean, really, he played two and a half games here in what five days. So good to see him, you know, being able to shoulder that kind of workload. Yeah, and he battled against St. Louis. Like, when the Blues were pushing, he actually kept the Flames with the three-goal lead, and he made sure that the game never got even remotely close. And, you know, you're not coming back, St. Louis. You're not Calgary. So no third-period comebacks for you. But, I mean, you know, even with the Philly game, I mean, they came back in that one. They dominated St. Louis. Like, is there a game this team can't win if they put their mind to it? Well, that's the thing. The the truly elite teams in the league can win games in any different style possible. And I don't know if we're quite there yet. We have kind of one no, style. Uh, no, but uh, they it depends on, like, what type of game. Like, they can win the physical battle type game, like against Minnesota. They can beat up teams that are bad, like St. Louis. And if something goes wrong and they give up four goals and, like, four minutes they can still beat you anyway and like there it, it just it doesn't seem like there's any team that right now that can come into calgary and say that oh we're gonna get two points it's gonna be a dog fight no matter which team comes in and which is what's making you know, it fun to watch flames hockey these days oh for sure and the Flames, like, even if they're playing a lesser team, like, say, a Philadelphia or a St. Louis, like, even if they go down a bit, they can just out-talent the other team and wear them down to get the two points. Before I move off this Blues game, a couple interesting notes here. Sam Bennett did not play this game. I think he's still this day-to-day, so probably just a little bit banged up at this point. Him and his epic Lanny mustache had to sit out. But instead, Michael Backlund drew back in the lineup. Good to see him. And Kirby Reichel recalled from the farm and played his first game as a Flame, wearing number 39. Um, we, we've already talked about the other call-up, Alan Quine, who lit the lamp here. What would you think of Reichel? Uh, Reichel wasn't bad. Uh, he has decent offensive instincts. He's just extremely slow as a skater compared to like NHL standards. Like He's not... Like and frankly, that's the thing that's held him back to this point in his career. Like it, the offensive talent is there, and if he was an average skater, you're looking at a top six forward. Well, that's why he only it's played a, nine and a half minutes. Yeah, and uh, you have to kind of shelter him because of that, and uh, you can't rely on him to do much of anything just because of that fact. And it's frustrating because you can see the talent there. It's just. With his lack of foot speed, it just it kind of ruins the player. Well, I'm not saying for this team this year, but because of that lack of foot speed, I mean, he's, I think he's got enough things together that he could be a 13th forward in the National Hockey League. Oh, yeah. I, uh, if you're talking like butter feeder teams, like he could play in the NHL even on a regular role. Like if you sent him to the LA Kings or Chicago Blackhawks, he'd find a role. It's just that, you know, in a team like Calgary, you're talking like 15th, 16th, 17th forward. And in order to make that move, the Flames had sent Mangiapane back to the AHL, which I think is a good move. I mean, you know my thoughts on Dubé. Mangiapane was up here. He served his purpose. And honestly, I'd rather have some of these veteran guys like Quine and Reichel taking up some of those bottom six spots. Well, plus it also sends a message to players that if the Flames are targeting them, that if you play well in Stockton, you'll get a shot in the NHL. And, you know, if you come in and play well, then you can stick. And, you know, whether it's guys like Grailvac or Peluso, Klein, 
it doesn't matter. Like, it, and that's you know, where remin- reminiscent of the first year Bob Hartley. I mean, you remember guys making the team like Juris, who we didn't think would, but they worked hard, and the Flames rewarded them for that. Yeah, and sometimes players that are getting a shot overperform just because they're getting an opportunity uh, where they wouldn't necessarily based on their talent level and can contribute in ways that you're not expecting like Juris in his rookie season. Yep. True. Well, as of now on uh, the 17th, when we record this, this one we don't see say very often, the Calgary flames are second in the NHL tied for second with Winnipeg at 46 points. And the only team above us is Tampa Bay at 52 points. who will be playing later in the, in the week, but um, 46 points in 34 games. I mean, this is not the Calgary Flames we're used to. No. Uh, this is the elite team version of the Calgary Flames, and the, it's foreign territory. You have to pretty much go all the way back to the when the Flames won the Stanley Cup for the Flames to be this caliber of team compared to the rest of the NHL. According to sportsclubstats.com, uh, which is a site that I use, they do a bunch of simulations this season. And in order for the Flames to be uh, – so playoff chances, in order for the Flames to have a 73% chance of the playoffs, they need 90 points. So they're already at 46. So, I mean, there's – to me, there's no doubt that we hit 90 this year. Yeah, well, if you look at it, there's 48 games to play. If they hit just 48 points the rest of the way – that's 94, so... So pretty much you know. playing at the pace they're at. Yeah. No, that's just getting, like, one point per game played. So, you know, and that's 94 points. So even if they just are literally 500 point percentage the rest of the way, they'll be in the playoffs. And that that's very encouraging, and hopefully the Flames can you know, keep pace with what they're doing and get in like the 108, 110 point level, give or take once the season ends. I mean, the last couple of times we've been in the playoffs, we've either just snuck in or been a middle team. But I mean, this is probably the first time in my lifetime. I'm, you know, my early thirties, you're in your early thirties that we don't remember really the, um, you know, we, we're too young to remember the, the it runs in 88 and 86 and 89 and you know around that time like the really good teams even some of the deep playoff runs not even stanley cup but this is the best flames team i can remember in my lifetime well like i started really following hockey in the 89 90 season and uh i was five and that's it but you don't remember uh, some of that emotional part of it right no but uh like, the Flames were good for, like, the first handful of years that I was watching hockey, and then you, once the Gilmore trade happened, then things started slowly dissolving away as good player after good player got traded away for nothing. And, you know, the Flames sucked for, like, 15 and years. And this is another year, and we've talked about it usually around playoff time, but this is the earliest I can remember that casual fans are talking about the Flames. Like, I'm hearing... You know, my mom and her friends talk about the Flames, and they don't watch hockey, but everybody knows the Flames are doing well, and it's it's a fun thing to be part of. Yeah, it's so foreign. Like, usually the Flames right now, like, even in the past handful of years, it's like, oh, well, they're, like, just in a playoff spot or, like, a couple points out, and, like, oh, well, if they go on a bit of a run, they can bounce back, that kind of thing. And, you know, like, to be not only in the playoffs, but 10 points at this point of the season over ninth place. Well, and and being first in the West and second in the NHL, like this is not barely in the playoffs. No, like that's like what? (laughs) You know, and like in past years, like uh, even like last year and the year before, like I was very bullish on the team like especially in our season preview predictions because of the fact that like i could see elements of this kind of a result happening it we were just a little on the early side for that but you know it it wasn't uh, entirely unexpected it's just that now that it's actually happening you're kind of like oh what (laughs) 
Yeah, it's it's weird to see. And I mean, you know, hopefully they'll be able to keep this team together for a while. We'll see how much they got to dole out for Chucky this season. But well, th- that's the thing. The Flames have a lot of extremely cheap contracts, especially uh, relative to what uh, they're uh, contributing on the ice. Like you look at Lindholm, and he's not even making five million a year. So you know, and. He's under for five years or and six years. And as great as Chucky's doing, as great as we want him to do, I mean, if he goes to the All Star game, he's gonna have to get paid for that. If he gets an award, he's gonna have to get paid for that. Like this could be a very expensive season for Chucky. Oh yeah, well, for and us, I mean, like I, I know, and I'm expecting something in the seven seven five range, like seven years, seven and a half, for him. And you know, and that's expensive, but he's damn good. So. You know, yeah, no, that's true. And, and you look at the flames; like it's not like we're screwed in terms of the cap. Like you got a good, useful player in uh, for a leak that you could trade to thirty other teams, and they'd gladly take them. You think there's one you team have, that doesn't want them? Well, us. Yeah, well, there's thirty two teams on there, our. But... Well. Seattle's not going to be playing for two years. Oh, that's so I don't true. Count okay, them yeah, yet. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I was kind of thinking you might keep him and dangle him in the expansion draft. But uh, you have Stone, who a bunch of teams could use a solid five-six defenseman. Yeah, I don't know though if he's been essentially surpassed by three H, three young, you know, two HL defensemen, well, one young guy. I don't know how much you get. Yeah, that. and if you're on the far on the phone with one of the GMs, you just say, uh, "Look at the standings. We're awesome." we just have so much depth that he can't play. Or Osman, he's contributed nothing to it. Do you want him? <laughs> well, that's the pessimistic take to it. But yeah, no, he's he's played well enough when he's been in the lineup. It's he's just, been in the lineup? He's played like as much as Dalton Prout has. Yeah, well, he got hurt right away, so. Who do you think you'd get more for, Stone or Prout? stone but you're probably only looking at like a fourth round pick or something like that not anything sexy in return stone's played 11 games he has four assists minus one and eight penalty minutes right now so not doing too badly yeah he's contributing and a, a lot of teams need those type of players like so like if the flames needed to shed you know seven million dollars in cap space you can trade those two guys off and i'll a lot of teams would be more than happy to take him off their hands. So, you know, then you have Mike Smith, who his contract's expiring, and Riddick's is as well, but, you know, Riddick's only going to get three, three and a half. Yeah, I mean, right now, Riddick's making less than a million, I think. Yeah, like, it, he's not going to make a ton of money. Like, even if he plays really well the rest of the season, he's not going to be making more than three and a half. So... You know, it's not that big of a deal, like, frankly. And, and the we team... know from, I mean, look at the, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but look at the Monaghan, look at the uh, Goudreau, look at the um, Lindholm contracts. Our GM is willing to go late in the summer to stare these guys down if he thinks he'll get them a better deal. Yeah. You know, oh, and for I wouldn't sure. be surprised if we see the same with Chucky. Yeah. I don't think that they'll go to the point of, uh, like Nylander's situation where, you know, sitting him out for the first two months of the season, but no, but even look at, I mean, Goudreau when we signed that, it was what the eve of the start of the season. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So the big, no, but like, if you look at like all of the flames cap hits, like there's not really anybody who stands out as like, Oh, that's a really a horrible contract. So, yeah, you know, like Neil and or James Neal's the only bad looking deal right now yeah. on this team. But yeah, you know, if he returns to form then that's fine. So if Dalton Proud outscores or sorry, if uh Alan Quine outscores him, then he's looking sure. bad. But like right right now, <laughs> like the Flames have almost a, uh like one point seven million dollars in cap space and they have some co- contracts expiring and uh, the Smith contract, which is nearly 4.3. So, you know, and then the cap's going to go up. So there's plenty of room where, like, it's not a problem. It's just... They'll find a way. Yeah. 
Well, the big talk over the last week has been the purple Gatorade. For those that don't know, um, there's as we know, hockey players are superstitious. And after that first line gets a goal lately, it's been Johnny Goudreau taking a drink of his purple Gatorade that's on the bench, or at least purple drink in a Gatorade bottle, and then spraying some in Monty's mouth and spraying some in Lindholm's mouth. And there's been memes online. It's actually kind of funny to watch. Um, Matt, we've got, as you know, names for different lines, like with the 3M line. What do you think if we put in a Prince reference here and start referring to these guys as Purple Rain? Well, you know, it, with the Jays, uh, Josh Donaldson was referred to as the bringer of rain. So, you know, why not have the 3M line or the Monaghan line being the Purple Rain line? That works. Raining the goals <laughs> down. How long do you think until the Calgary Flames start selling purple sports drink on uh, on the concourse for 10 bucks? Any day now. <laughs> I mean, do you remember back, what was it? I think it was, I don't know if it was the 04 run when we, everyone started wearing the uh, green hard hats to the yeah, games. Yeah, and the Commodore Afros, I remember yeah, those. Yeah, and, and the team capitalized on those, so I'm just waiting for them to capitalize on the purple sports drink. Yeah. We don't even know if it's a Gatorade in there. It's a Gatorade bottle. For all we know, the uh, the equipment manager is just filling it with Walmart brand purple drink. Yeah. Got to, you know, play that Dave Chappelle clip. You know, give me that purple drink. But it's, it's kind of, a, again, a neat thing. We're, we're all excited about this season, and so we can have fun with those kind of things. I think if this team was not doing well, we wouldn't be having fun with those kind of memes for this team. Just like you've seen the, uh, the Riddick Salt Oh yeah, for sure. Thing, so that's how you know your team's doing well when people are making memes about it and we're having fun. Yeah, well, you know when the the other teams suck in in the games, you know you have to do something to amuse yourself. You know. <laughs> well, you can you can enjoy us creaming everybody else. Well, that that gets boring after a while. You know, You've gotta find other things to do. We only have to watch them do it eighty two times. Yeah, it gets old. You know, like. Oh, gee, we won again. You know, gee, that's that's exciting. Well, don't jinx us. Don't <laughs> jinx us. Knock on wood here. <laughs> At the beginning of the season, you and I made some season predictions. I thought since we're halfway done by calendar, I mean, we're coming to the end of the calendar year, uh, why don't we take a look at where we're at and see how we fare with our predictions right now? So the first question that we asked was, who do you think will have a breakout season this season? I'd said Jankowski and you said Zarnik. Uh, if we take a look at where they're at, Zarnik is, so far, he's played 21 games, two goals, and four assists for six points, which isn't quite his career high yet, but he's on pace to do that. And Jankowski right now is 31 games in, four goals, eight assists for 12 points. You and I have talked about some of Janko's struggles, but I really think over the last 10 days, he's really been coming back into form. Yeah, uh, it's been... Uh Frankly, about the middle of November, he's started to slowly come on more and be more of the player that we were used to last season. And hopefully he can continue. And for Zarnik, you know, I have a track record dating back to like 2004 of picking players that, oh, I think they'll have a, a really good year and then they absolutely have a terrible season. <laughs> Well, I don't even know if I'd say Zarnik's having a terrible season, but he's become the 13th forward, and I think for a 13th forward, he's about where you want him to be. Yeah, I know, but I think that there was more expectations that he'd break out and be more of a middle six forward on a consistent basis and a contributor. I think in the offseason, you're even penciling him in on the second line. Yeah. Could have picked Alan Quine. Well, yeah, true enough. Um, we we both also picked who we thought would struggle this season. I picked Michael Froelich, and I think you were right on when you said James Neal. Yeah. Well, I'm with Neal. He's looking a lot like Paul Byron did with the Flames, in that lots of opportunities, and for whatever reason, they're just not going in for him. Law and of even if Neil starts scoring now, though, we're so far into the season, I mean, he can't make up his numbers. Oh, well, you never know. Like, he's had hot streaks where he gets, like, eight goals in ten games before, so, like, he could easily, 
especially with how many chances he gets on a nightly basis, he could easily do that if it starts going in for him. It's just, I think that he himself is trying too hard to, and putting too much pressure on himself instead of just, sort of like Sam Bennett before, where we would say that like he just was trying to do too much and getting in his own way. And I think Neil, it's the same thing. And he's getting into the right spots. It's just it either the defense is there or when he does take a shot, it hits the post or the goalie makes a ridiculous save. And those will I've go in. I've been trying to watch it, Neil lately, a... trying to figure out what's up with him. And tell me if you think the same, but... I mean, his line's been shuffled, but on his line, it seems like there's not a lot of tape-to-tape passes. The passes are sent in yeah. the area of the player, and you've got to be lucky to skate ahead enough to and, grab it. And I think that's making Neil make one or two extra moves. That's why, like I was mentioning a few weeks ago about uh, at the trade deadline, adding a forward a playmaker to throw on the line with Neil, someone who can actually pass the puck See, I think we have that guy. Then that could be Froelich. I don't think Froelich's that good with that, though. Like, I'm talking, like, somebody who's a borderline, like, top six forward. You know, like, a a decent guy. Like, Hoodler or Hemsky from years gone by. Just somebody decent. Like, you know, you're not needing somebody to be awesome just you know can the guy make a crisp pass that's the only well, i mean thing that he should really be a requirement of anyone playing in the national hockey league unfortunately you know that's not always the case and you know i think the flames could use another guy who can pass the puck accurately and i think that if the flames can get that type of a guy or shuffle neil's line where he's playing with somebody who can make those type of passes, then he'll start scoring more. It's just that, as you said, like it, the passes aren't quite working, and like he's having to reach for pucks and c- that kind of stuff. And when with most of his goals, it's like on the stick, off the stick. And like when he scored against Colorado last month. It, it Gaudreau fed him a pass one time or top corner it the play was over in less than a second it was just bang bang in that okay thank you and we're we're not seeing those caliber of passes heading to Neil and that's why he's partially been a little neutered offensively because of the fact that he can't just pull the trigger yeah, I don't know. We'll talk more about trades as we get nearer to the deadline. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't disagree that that's what we need to bring in. But as always, I'm worried about the cost of acquisition. Well, like, even it, in the past, like those types of guys, like you're not needing like somebody exceptional. You know, you're just needing somebody like even a guy like uh, Vanek from uh, Vancouver last year or, you know, just a anybody who's competent enough offensively who can pass the puck and to me that guy's gonna have to be a rental oh yeah for sure i'd have to i'd have to check and we'll do it as we get closer but i'd have to check and see who's available rental wise yeah that'll be an interesting topic but it's not somebody that you're gonna need to go spend like a first or a second round pick like there's no need to go that ridiculous like a depth prospect like a manjapani or you know, a mid to late round pick should be. Yeah, I don't know if that gets the deal done, though. If you look at what uh, deadline prices have been in the last couple of years. Oh, no. Well, uh, yeah, n- yes and no. Like, uh, it, it won't be an expensive guy uh, either way. Like, I'm not, I wouldn't expect it to be more than a third round pick. The next question we ask is, will Mike Smith be able to stay healthy? And he hasn't had a great season, but he's been healthy for really all except the one game we brought Gillies up for, so... Cross your fingers. So far, he's been healthy. Hopefully, he continues that way. Yeah. Uh, as long as he can start playing more like he has been recently and just continue playing like that, everything will be fine. And that's uh, about you, it. You and I guessed who the first call-ups would be, both forward and defense. We were both right on defense. It was Anderson. I don't think either of us expected the first call-up to be Peluso. No. And he's been up a couple times. Yeah, 
And he's done well enough when he's been in. He's done his job. We both predicted who we thought would be the first guy traded. Do you remember who you thought would be traded first? I think it was for Leak, wasn't it? Michael Stone? Yeah. Um, I thought it would be either Bennett or Froleek, so all those guys still on the team. The one thing that's got to be bad, I mean, Bennett, I think, has found his role on this line with Kachuk. He's looked really good there. The fact that Froleek has been out for a while, I don't know about you, I don't think this team misses him, and that's a bad place to be in. Well, you could. that's one of those things. The Flames just have such a ridiculous amount of depth where you can lose a pivotal player like a Froleek, who is a top defensive forward in the NHL and not skip a beat and like for only because of yeah I mean good for the team but bad for for leak oh yes and no like I don't see the flames like calling everybody to say oh trade him now or anything like that no I don't think that but I think just the fact that they're getting by okay without you means that you know, you might get demoted down the lineup. You might not get back in right away. Like, you kind of want the team to be sort of like Backlund, where it's like, wow, we really feel the loss of this guy. Yeah, and frankly, he'll probably end up slotting in on the line with uh, Ryan and Neil when he gets back. And, yeah, it, that's fine. Yeah, like the, you know, good on Bennett for getting some chemistry with Kachuk, and we'll see how that goes. We have a couple of questions here about the playoffs, which we won't deal with now, um, but we both thought that this team would be pretty close and would get in the playoffs, but the last one we'll go through. Where will the Flames finish in the regular season and the Pacific? And I said they'll probably be second in the Pacific Division, third at the worst. You said first if their goaltending is good, otherwise second or third. So I think this team hasn't had great goaltending, and we're blowing both of our expectations out of the water. Yeah, and... Um... Yeah, you know, Riddick has been very good most of the season. To me, he's the big surprise so far. Yeah, and... I mean, you and I went to an Edmonton game where we couldn't even stop Edmonton rookies, and now he's, you know, one of the better-looking goalies in the National Hockey League. I know. And he... When we watched that game, at, at the back of my mind, I was thinking, huh, this reminds me of Kipper when he was in preseason, where... He just, his give a crap meter was at zero. And yeah, but to me, Kipper was, I mean, he was an established goalie. He's yeah. going to earn that right. Oh, I know. He was fighting and for a spot. I'm going, uh, yeah, like that's ballsy if that's what Riddick's doing and just not caring because he's just waiting for the regular season to start. So, you know, and good on him. He's been dynamite every appearance. Like He's only had one so-so appearance thus far this season, so... Yeah, you know, it's a, he's at least put himself in the position where he's a legitimate co- talk about him being the number one goalie moving forward. So and that's good on him. Um, last question I'll ask you as we sort of reflect on the 2018 portion of the season and head into the 2019 portion. Thoughts on the new coach, Bill Peters? Well, last year, like when uh, around this time last year when I had my little rant episode and was saying that we should have fired Gullitson and hired a guy like Daryl Sutter. I think you said Daryl Sutter. Yeah, I did. Uh, We ended up signing a guy that is basically a carbon copy of the type of coach that Sutter is. Just so you know, Matt, that was, I think, the highest download episode last season. Yeah, and, you know, um, frankly, the team is looking, like, stylistically, Peters is a bit acerbic, and he will challenge players to be better, and he knows how to manipulate the lineup to get the best results, period. And is very flexible in terms of working with players to get the best out of them instead of adhering solely to a system. And that type of attitude, I think, was necessary to get the best out of the players. And we saw last year that like the whole teams, they just didn't care. And... Like now, it seems like everybody's having fun and is emotionally invested in each other. Like we're actually seeing players stand up for their teammates. Where last year, it's like, "Oh, you got hit. Yeah, well, 
screw you i'm going you to the bench head up. yeah screw you i'm going to the bench <laughs> or like that doubt da- that dowdy line change yeah did you see that uh which one uh they were playing against pittsburgh and right as the man was in front he just skated to the bench yeah. like auto line change just turned on yeah <laughs> i don't care anymore <laughs> um you know, and I think you said something important there is last year we talked a lot about Gullitson putting the lineup in the blender and changing it. And in some ways, looking back now with a clear head, I think he was doing it because he didn't know what to do. It was like, the only thing I know is let's try moving these players around and hope for a different result. Where Peters, we see him move the lineup, but he's doing it strategically. Like he knows what he's looking for in a line. He's trying to put, he's trying to find the right pieces to fit what he's looking for in each of his four lines. Yeah, and we saw that the other day with the Minnesota game where he switched up the uh, first and second line to try and get them going, and it ended up working as uh, Neil uh, Lindholm and uh, Kachuk combined for the game winner, and. You know, it's one of those situations where this team needs to be able to have the flexibility, if something isn't working on a given night, to be able to adapt on the fly. And that's something that is extremely hard to do, and very few teams can actually do it. And the Flames seem to be one of those teams where... Oh, this isn't working. Let's go. And well, at the same time, knowing what is working, like we've seen that top line together because it's working. And in the past, Gully would have put that first line in a blender and said, "Well, these guys are good. Let's put them all over the lineup." Yeah, and the power play has been a revelation for the team. And stealing that coach from New Jersey, uh, Jeff Ward. Jeff Ward uh, was a stroke of brilliance on Trey Living's part because that. The power play has actually been good, it, where last year it was complete <laughs> crap, frankly. And it it was the same, it was so predictable that, you know, anybody could devise a way to shut that power play down. And especially with the talent the Flames had, like, there was no reason why it should have been 28th last year. You'd mentioned earlier, and I agree with you, I think I see a lot of similarity between Peters and the Sutter style, if you will. Um, I've spent some time around both him and Gully in the coach's room and, you know, doing some of the media scrums and that sort of thing. And as much as Gully always knew what to say at some point, he almost seemed like he was trying to over-engineer his answers to games. And with Peters, he's, like you say, he's no nonsense. He doesn't have a lot of things to say just to the media, if that makes sense. He's not a soundbite guy like I think Gully was, but he reminds me a lot of a Sutter and that he gives these one or two word answers. He gets fired up about his guys in a good way, but he also, you know, it's like, well, we just got to clean this up or clean that up. It's not like it's the end of the world when they lose. Like, well, just got to clean this thing up or, you know, yeah, clean this up. And, and he looks at it as a process. Oh, yeah. And that's the way, you know, because all the players are human and you're going to have games where things screw up like you look at that flyers game like that's not how like anybody would want how the defense played in that game like it was horrible it for that second period like they were just allowing everybody to go here have a goal thanks you know and those kind of things are going to happen and you need to be able to just maturely walk through it with the players to get them going back onto the right page. And like before with this team, you would have seen the flames go on a four or five game losing streak on that type of a game. Like even if they won that game, they would have lost for a while because they wouldn't be able to reset themselves properly. And Peter seems to be able to manage the players. Well, where, okay, you guys won, great, awesome, but you did make a whole host of mistakes. Let's work on these so that way that doesn't happen again. Yeah. Well, if you remember this time last year, I mean, we are about three weeks away from the infamous gullets and stick-throwing incident last year when this team was in a bad spot. And Peters always seems calm and collected, and I think maybe, I mean, I don't know a lot of what we see behind closed doors, but I think a lot like Sutter, that might be part of his charm is he doesn't, he's not phased, you know, he doesn't get into really, I mean, he's not like Tortorella where we've seen him, you know, um, 
lunge at other coaches and attack guys in the dressing room. Uh, who was a couple of years ago who snapped? Oh, was that Playfair? Who yeah. Snapped the sticks. You know, and he just seems like he's always sort of even keeled. And I think that's an important part of this coach is win, lose, or draw. He's just there coaching his team. Yeah. If that makes any sense. You know, he's not reacting. He's not yelling at these guys. He's just there, you know, being that rock. No, and, you know, like uh, in that uh, practice after the Flyers game, like Monaghan screwed up a drill so badly that uh, he made the players do a like stop the drill and go for a skate and you know like you guys got to do better than this type of thing and like if they're screwing up that he's willing to you know say hey you know you guys got to do better and that but and it seems like the players are willing to accept that i mean there's sometimes the coaches say that and it's like ah screw you coach yeah, but you know they're getting results so it's hard to complain well, you that's know. it when you're when you're winning yeah. it's hard to complain so, yeah, I'm, I think this is, to me, I think Peter's the coach we've been looking for for a while. He wasn't the big name that we wanted when he got hired. I mean, you and I talked about Quenville and a few other guys in the offseason, but he's turned out, I think, to be the coach this team needs. Definitely. I'll be excited to see how this season ends with him behind the bench. Yeah, and hopefully because of the fact the Flames only play a handful of games against very good teams for the next, like, couple months. That it'll be interesting to see because of the fact that in the past, the Flames have always been able to get up for the good teams. And, you know, they beat the best teams in the NHL. Like, last year, they beat Washington. They beat Pittsburgh twice. They've beaten everybody. You know, and yet they when they'd play the loser teams, they'd play to their level and end up dropping games that they should have easily won. And it'll be interesting to see, because of the fact the Flames' schedule for the first couple months of the season has been mostly elite teams, and now they're going to be playing more of the lower end of the table, how do they respond to that when you're playing teams that, frankly, are terrible? Like, are you going to have your whole game fall apart, or are you just going to roll over them? And that, it, you know, it's a different way... A uh, different type of adversity of like we're on a different talent sphere than these guys. Can we keep what we're doing correct while we're playing these guys? And you know, it'll be interesting to see. Well, let's talk about that. So, this is our last show of 2018. We're going to take the holidays off a uh, couple weeks here, but we will make sure there's always something in the feed every week. So Christmas Eve, we won't be recording and likely New Year's Eve, we won't be recording, but we'll have some interviews, best of shows, that sort of thing to make sure there's something in the feed for you guys. Um, we'll probably have the Peter Marr interview from a couple weeks ago. We'll replay the Theo Fleury interview. We'll make sure that you guys don't go without Flames content for a couple weeks. And Matt, you were talking about good and bad teams. So if we take a look till the end of the calendar year, we play both good and bad teams. We have Dallas tomorrow night, then the Tampa Bay Lightning come to town, then St. Louis again. Hopefully we can stomp on them. The Flames get a four-game Christmas break, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th off. And then 27th, quick trip up to Winnipeg before coming back here for games against Vancouver and San Jose. And that San Jose and Vancouver game are uh, at the Dome. The San Jose is on New Year's Eve. If you've never been to a New Year's Eve game, that's a fun one. And we've said this the last couple of weeks, SeatGiant.ca has got some great prices on tickets. I just checked that New Year's Eve game today. 55 bucks for the second level per ticket. So if you're looking for a Christmas gift for yourself, for a last-minute gift for somebody else, go to SeatGiant.ca, enter our code FIRESIDE. You'll get some really good prices for the Flames. And as we talked about, this is a great run. Don't miss out on this. The Dome is so much fun this year to be part of. It's I think the best atmosphere I can remember in the Dome. So be there, be wearing your red, be part of the Sea of Red, take in this team while they're doing well. Yeah, and with the six games remaining this month, we have two against elite teams, two against decent teams in Dallas and San Jose, and then two against... Crane Frank, teams. Yeah, bottom feeders. And, and uh, the Tampa Bay and the Winnipeg games are really going to be the sort of the benchmark setters for me. If we can beat Tampa Bay or even if we can look good against Tampa Bay and against Winnipeg, I think it helps show where the Flames for real. 
Yeah, like, frankly, if they split the two, I'm fine with that. But if they lose both, that that would be a little concerning. Just a little, you know, because, like, okay, yeah, you can beat up all these mediocre teams, but the good ones you can't. Well, so, I think it depends how you lose, too. I mean, if true. this is a, uh, you know, if this is a Pittsburgh Penguins where it's a 9-1 loss, I don't care if we split them. If you lose 9-1 to Tempa, you're not in that elite category. Now, if it becomes like a, a Flyers game where we find a way and the find a way Flames come back and win it, you're telling a very different story there. So to me, it's not about winning. It's about competing in those two games. Yeah. And like, if you look ahead even to next month, like there's not really that many good games. Like uh, they play once against Boston, Colorado, and Buffalo, and those being the good games. And like they play Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, Florida, uh, Detroit again, Edmonton, Arizona, Carolina, like, those are a lot of mediocre teams there. So, Well, if we go in order here, the Flames start January on the road. They do Detroit and Boston in a back-to-back. Then they have a day off, go to Philly. Then another day off and go to Chicago. That's, to me, a very winnable road trip. Yeah. Like, frankly, they should take three or four. Well, and three, three games against the East, too, which are almost free points to rack up. Yeah. Um, then they come back for five games. They play Colorado, your other favorite team, the Panthers, um, Arizona, Buffalo, and Detroit again at home. And then Edmonton, Carolina to round out the night. Like, it's a very winnable month. Yeah. Like, frankly, they should be rolling through January. So, like, that's where, like, the the Flames are going to be facing a bit of a different type of adversity where they're clearly better than all of, pretty much all of those teams. And it's like, okay, well, you should be winning each of them. Can you actually follow through and do that? Like, you know, it. you have to raise the expectations now because you're one of the top teams. Now, you're expected to go out and basically murder all of them. Go out and do it. And, like, there's not any excuses where, like, they, they should pretty much win... There's what, uh, five, ten, eleven games. They should win at least eight of them. Between now and the bye week? Uh, at the end of January? I'm just talking January's games. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's eleven of them in January. And frankly, eight they should win. So 17 from today. Yeah. And I think another big thing that's good, and we're starting to see this. We saw this uh, in the earlier this month on the second that week, but... Starting to play every other. Yeah. I mean, we had we had an easier schedule if you look at October, November, a couple, you know, three-day breaks, two-day breaks. For the rest of this month, pretty much, the Flames are playing until Christmas every other. They get back to playing every other for December. And then really, I mean, with a couple exceptions, uh, right up until the 23rd of January, they're playing every other. So this is, I think, where the stamina of this team is going to start coming in. Yeah. And February is a little easier. Uh, there's a couple of breaks in there. But yeah, it's it'll be a, a bit of a tough stretch. Uh, in well, terms February, of- February is a bit different to me, too, because they're coming off their bye week. They should be rested at that point. True enough. Right. I mean, that's your time to to recap and recoup and, you know, as a team sort of get yourself back into that right frame of mind mentally and physically. And they've got from the 23rd to the 1st off with no game. Oh, no, the 23rd to the 31st of January with no games. So um, I I think that to me, it's get through the car, get through to the 22nd and then you've got a week off and they're going to get banged up. But we got to keep them going. Yeah. Well, they're off for you can't nine get any days. Major injuries, you know, or eight days between games. So, well, even before that, I mean, they play in Edmonton, then they have two days off, then they play Carolina, then they're off again. So, that Carolina game might be hard for them to get up for. We'll see. Yeah. But let's not focus on those ones. Let's focus on the rest of December. Uh, these games against Dallas, Tampa Bay, St. Louis, Winnipeg, Vancouver, San Jose. Matt, first off, who who would you go to in net tomorrow against Dallas? I'd probably go Riddick just uh, to keep Smith. You know, he's not 100% probably. And, uh, yeah, you could go Smith. It's a bit of a coin toss. It depends on how Smith is feeling, frankly. If he's all right, I'd start him against Dallas. And, you know, it... And what about Tampa? Uh, I'd probably go Riddick. 
It's a big vote of confidence for Ritter. Yeah, well, he when you've played as many games as he has and you've played well, okay, you, you've done well against some bad teams. Let's see how you do against a good team. Yeah, exactly. Like, you've passed the test thus far against all the teams, basically, that he's played. Okay, let's have some fun, you know, and see how you do. Because he, he needs to be able to show that he can be, uh, in order for him to take that next step to be a starting goaltender, he needs to be able to go against a team like Tampa and win. And, you know, having that opportunity, I think would be a good vote of confidence both for him and if he actually wins that game then like moving forward you can actually rely on him regardless of which opponent you're facing and not have well, to again, worry for me, about especially being an eastern conference team it's going to be fun if we beat them but it's not a must win game for the flames stats wise so as long as they i agree i'd put riddick in and i think as long as he's competitive that's all we can ask for yeah like it, it say like the flames lose that one four three and he did very well despite giving up four goals like that that would be fine it if he gets the win hey even better because then you now know that you can rely on him regardless of what team you're facing and that'll be interesting to see well matt you won last week's predictions you suggested the flames would sweep and they did so why don't you predict first this week Win Dallas, win Tampa, win St. Louis, lose Winnipeg, win Vancouver, win San Jose. So you think win in Dallas, win in Tampa Bay, um, win in, they better win in St. Louis. Yeah. And then what'd you think for Winnipeg? Lose and then win, win. Five out of six. Mind you, like if they go three and three, I'll, I'll be happy. You know, like they were seven and one to start the month. So getting 10 wins, it- you know, like that'd be fine. Those first couple games after Christmas are always a bit of a struggle. Yeah, I know. Like, I remember that one year where we got shut out like four times in a row or something like that right after Christmas. And it's like, uh, did you guys forget how to play hockey? (laughs) The nice thing here, I think, is they'll go into the Christmas break, hopefully on a bit of a high after taking on St. Louis. And then it's a short trip to Winnipeg. So, um, you know, they're not going to have to get in a plane and go halfway across the continent or anything. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with, I think the Flames will beat Dallas, St. Louis, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. I think they're going to lose to Tampa Bay, and I think they're going to lose to San Jose. Huh. Um, I, I Again, I think after Christmas, they can coast by for a couple games against Winnipeg. I think they can beat Vancouver, but I think San Jose in that New Year's game, I just have a, a hunch that it's going to be a tough one for the Flames. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. San Jose is a see- good team, and they're finally starting to turn the corner after their early season struggles frankly so well and they're a lot like philly i think you know we underestimated philly and philly gave us a run for our money and last time we played san jose on the 11th of november they beat us 3-1 so i think they're a team that because we're higher than them in the standings i think we're underestimating them a bit yeah well still they're like only one of what uh seven 12 teams to have 40 points on the season. So, you know, like they're one of the better teams and yeah. And on paper, they're a very good team. Yeah, And frankly, they, they're, forwards. they're better than what their record says. So what's well, it. And I, I, I have a feeling that San Jose is going to come alive and I just think that it's going to be a Calgary's expense on, in that game. Yeah. And when do we play them? We don't even see them again for over a month. So they can come alive. And as long as they cool off again by February 7th, We're good. Well, we want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Thanks again for listening to us in 2018. If you have any Flames comments, share over the break. Uh, Let us know. We can always be contacted on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or you can give us a call. Leave us a voicemail or text us at 587-200-7176. We'd love to hear from you guys. Um, and we'll talk to everyone again in 2019. That's a weird thing to be saying already. Yep, and it's been a blast thus far this season, and even covering the offseason and looking forward to how things would shake out after the end of the Gulletson era. So it'll be interesting to see where this Flames team goes, and 
that all signs are looking good thus far, and hopefully they can just follow through and keep it up. You ready to podcast in the late June, Matt? Oh, the, that would be awesome. You know, I mean, frankly, I have nothing better to do. I'd like to be talking on Fireside Chat right up to the draft. Well, I don't know if we're going to go that far, but we'll see. Oh, uh, that'd be fun, though. You and you and I are gonna we're gonna understand what these guys make the Stanley Cup feel like. By the time we get a day off, it'll be rookie camp, and then it'll be preseason again already. Oh, I know. Like if the Flames actually do go deep and say to the finals, then it, you know we're looking at like what a week and a half off, and then oh, it's the draft, and then another week, and then oh, development camp and. Well, and I honestly wonder, like, we haven't been in that situation no. in a while, but you wonder if they push Dev Camp back at that point. I'd have to see what other teams have done in the past. No, they don't. No? It's a, a long time for these guys without getting a break then, these front office guys. Yeah, yeah you're pretty much going and enjoy the couple of months off after the development camp then. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, if you're a tree living, you might have some contracts to figure out, and but you can do that from the lake, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, Matt, well, you have a great holiday, and we'll talk to you again in 2019. Thank you for listening, everybody, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.